The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. Filipinos have a very interesting relationship with democracy. The kind of expectations of transformation through democracy are very kind of tempered in the Philippines because why would you have expectations that democracy is going to transform your nation and your life when it really never has? But what I've found is that people are more ambivalent about democracy than they are kind of unconditionally committed to it. One aspect of this is also class. If you engage with the middle class in the Philippines or those who are educated, they would say, okay, democracy is unhealthy, democracy is however they experience it. But if you look at more of the urban poor or rural poor populations, I don't think they would even have democracy as a concern because they would be so concerned about their everyday living. In this episode, gauging the health of democracy in the Philippines under Bongbong Marcos. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. As we reach the one-year mark since Ferdinand Marcos Jr. was sworn in as president, what's his administration bringing to the Philippines and the lives of ordinary Filipinos? How different is the country under the man commonly known as Bongbong? He won the presidency with an historic majority, despite, or perhaps because, he's the son and namesake of Ferdinand Marcos Sr., the president-turned-dictator so dramatically ousted by the People Power Movement of 1986. Bongbong Marcos took over from Rodrigo Duterte, whose populist and authoritarian brand of politics courted global controversy with a war on drugs that effectively gave the green light to thousands of extrajudicial killings. Media outlets, human rights activists and judicial figures who criticised Duterte were often made to pay a hefty price, leaving a serious question mark over the country's democratic credentials. So how is the younger President Marcos putting his own stamp on the political landscape of the Philippines? To what extent is Bongbong continuing the practices and policies of Duterte? And how much is the enviable economic growth of the Philippines in recent years masking a decline in democracy? Joining me to look at democracy under Bongbong Marcos are Philippines Watch's Dr Adele Webb, Research Fellow at the Centre of Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra, and David Lazada, current PhD candidate at Asia Institute. Welcome Adele and welcome David. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, happy to be here. Let's start with a big picture look before we drill down into policy details. A year on... Is it a very different government in the Philippines, Adele? I think it probably feels different when you're there. It looks different from the outside. Philippine politics really broadly is a story of continuity and change. So while some things never seem to change and there's a lot of impenetrability about Philippine politics, at the same time, there's always different people on the landscape, different figures, different names and so on. But of course, in this case, Marcos' name is not a new new one in the Philippine story. So I think, I mean, the world has changed a lot in the last 12 months. We're no longer at the height of a a pandemic, which had such a devastating impact on countries like the Philippines who don't have the contingency to cope like Australia. So, I mean, the world is just different. Politics are too, but some things remain the same. Different, but the same, David. Do you agree with that characterization? Yeah, actually, if you talk to a lot of the activists in the Philippines right now, there's two camps. One of them would say it's not different in terms of the economic policies, what Marcos Jr. has been doing. But on the other side, some of the activists who are closely monitoring the war on drugs and extrajudicial killings are going to say it's continuing with the killings specifically targeting different groups. The, the side that argues for a different uh, side of the story would say Marcos has not done anything as bad as Duterte, which is a very low bar to begin with, but that in itself gives civil society activists some space to regroup and rethink about what they're doing, about their strategies, on how to potentially contest government abuses in the future. 
we'll return to this and, and we'll look at, at at how some of those policies are continuing. But David, if I can ask you before we get to those sorts of specifics of policy, what was the platform that Marcos actually was elected on? What did he promise? Yeah, that's very interesting because he gave very vague terms and very broad terms in his campaign. He ran on a platform of unity. And during the campaign period, he was very distinct in that he didn't even give media interviews. He didn't participate in any of the presidential debates. What he ran on was the broad term of unity, uniting the country after the divisive Duterte presidency. And this was actually reflected in the alliances that he built to to become president. Broadly on the economic platforms was infrastructure, continuing the build, build, build program of Duterte. Um, But a lot of the campaign messaging was mostly on nostalgia of the Philippines was great during the time of my father. I'm going to do the same. So those were the, in broad terms, the campaign promises. It's very hard to identify specific policies because he didn't have any. I guess their strategy was less talk, less mistakes. And he's not actively putting a target on his back by discussing specific policy details. Adele, I want to ask you about the father, but before we get there, that unity that David was just referring to, that was really reflected, wasn't it, in the choice of vice presidential running mate, uh, Sarah Duterte, daughter of the incumbent prior to Marcos? Yeah. I mean, David's right there. There was like very little kind of programmatic speech during the campaign. Um, But I want to make the point also that that's not particularly unusual in Philippine politics. I mean, like in many other countries that are in a similar kind of um, democracy functions in a similar way, it's kind of more moralistic, uh, personalistic election campaigning rather than programmatic. So just to kind of give some background, the Philippines has a very weak, if if not absent altogether, political party system that in terms of kind of dividing people along ideology or ethnicity and so on. So it's often the case that election campaigns are run on fairly aspirational, slogan-driven kind of language. And in this case, yes, unity is very significant. He just kept coming back to it. I think there was one case where he did a speech just before the election and he said unity 21 times. People started counting how many times he was saying it. And of course, he was doing that with his running mate, Sarah Duterte, the daughter of the former president. And together, that unity kind of represented, well, it represented a number of things, actually. It was a very usable, very, very kind of convenient term for them. On the one hand, it represents kind of this unity of the country. I mean, the Marcoses control the north. And Duterte's, of course, are so huge in the south, down in Davao. In Mindanao, so it was a unifying of the Philippine Islands of the Philippine Archipelago. It was also a unifying of these two very powerful political families who, for a long time, people thought these two offspring of authoritarian figures would actually run against each other in this election. But instead, Sarah Duterte chose to run with Bongbong Marcos. But I think there's an even more interesting layer to this unity message because they used it in a way to basically build a narrative that was light, that was positive, and that avoided conversations about human rights abuses, about the corruption of his father during that dark period of martial law. And instead, they could say things like, let's not look to the past. We are not into division. We don't want trouble. We want to come together as a country and move forward into our prosperous future, which he, of course, thinks that he is the custodian of. It's also a very historical narrative that that ties into things that his father would have said to appeal to voters successfully in the late 60s, early 70s. So there's this kind of continuity there, but it was a very powerful message. And he's still talking about unity today. So, David, even with the weak party system that Adele was just talking about, how can it be that someone who is the son of a man who literally looted the country and was removed by a people power revolution, how can the son of the man become president? Um, That's a very interesting question. If you ask experts, and certainly for Filipinos on the ground, it's historical revisionism that the Marcos family has been doing for decades. It started during the 2016 elections, even before that. But in the 2016 elections, that was really a test of how 
a Marcos can win a national post via the vice presidency. He lost by a few hundred thousand votes that time, but that really was setting a tone that a Marcos presidency is possible again. Um, but if you look back as early as the 1990s and the 2000s, the Marcos family wasn't really prosecuted for their crimes. They were able to hold on to their stronghold in the north and build their alliances there. So slowly it was changing the mindset and like trying to put in the narrative that what happened during the Marcos senior years was the golden years in the Philippines. Interestingly, when I asked some of my sources in the human rights space, they said if you look at the textbooks that the Department of Education was using, even the way they described the Marcos presidency at the time during the 90s and the 2000s, it was described as the golden years. So they're suspecting that the Marcos has even had connections with the publishers of these books to ingrain to the students and to the children that those were golden years. So now that you have voters who went through that curriculum system that didn't teach about the human rights abuses of the Marcos regime, they don't know about it. They don't know about the history of what's happening. This is a personal question to me also because even my own family who lived through those years are always saying, no, it's it was a good time to be a Filipino. We had good economic policies during that time. And I guess it's also because the human rights abuses were relatively concentrated in the Metro Manila and other metro areas around the country. And the Marcos regime had control of the media. So for the rest of the Philippine population, they didn't really have any idea of what was happening, the human rights abuses that were happening to activists and human rights journalists. So you have that narrative that was changed via social media, but also a longer game strategy in terms of the education system and just their image in general. Adele, how do you see it? I mean, I know that the Marcos family has actually been involved in politics for some time, but how do you see the connection between Marcos Jr. and Marcos Sr.? And indeed, is he his father's son? Are there discernible connections? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And just to kind of second what David's saying, that this moment of the rise again of the Marcoses, maybe to the outside, it looks surprising and even unexpected, but certainly from the inside, it's not. They've been back in politics, in positions of politics since 1991, and in fact, having expanded their kind of family dynastic control of political positions um, from the time that his father was in there. But the relationship between the two is really interesting. He often got compared to his father during the campaign. He kind of wore the same iconic red polo shirt and so on. But he would often say, I don't want to be judged by history. I want to be judged by my actions. And that was a way of kind of distancing himself from the past. But at the same time, he invoked so much of the legacy of his father in order to appeal to people. So there was this sort of contradiction at the heart of his platform. But what's really interesting, and it's actually only really becoming clear in the kind of weeks and months that have just passed, especially since the 37th anniversary of the EDSA People Power revolution that overthrew his father and forced him to flee the country and, you know, be escorted by the US to Hawaii, there's this sort of connection that Marcos Jr. is drawing between his father's regime and his regime. And it's to say that what happened in the middle is a kind of like a, a disruption. That was the problem. But now we're back to the agenda of nation building and now I'm back doing, you know, what my father started and so on. So it's this kind of really interesting inversion of his story because actually in that 1986 moment, the hundreds of thousands of people around the country, but particularly centred on Metro Manila, supported the defecting military and forced Marcos and his family to flee. And the period after that was considered the burgeoning of kind of Philippine democracy, the birth of new democracy, the kind of invigoration, the confirmation that Filipinos wanted democracy and so on. But he's actually turning it around and saying, you know, I'll lay a wreath of flowers on the statue that marks that moment in 1986, but almost doing it in a way to say, let's put to rest this disruptive and terrible part of our history. And let's basically kind of continue to solidify the line between my father and me. 
So suddenly this moment that has been for the longest time, the kind of defining moment in a good way in Philippine political history has become, in his narrative, the problem. And he's healing the divisions that it caused. And it's kind of incredible revision, but it's almost more than that. It's kind of this kind of invoking the ghosts of history and denying this kind of amazing juncture that happened in their political life. So, David, why do people buy into that revision? Um, Well, it's exactly what Adele also said. That period of time from 1986 to 2016 is seen as the heyday of the height of neoliberalism, policies that were row market and not really focused on social services. So in my own circles, people are tired of the same economic policies that have been used in the Philippines. And they say, to an extent, I'm tired of human rights and all these pro-democracy types of narratives when my life is not improving. So to an extent, people are saying, it's okay to give up some of my rights in order to have a better life. And this was a narrative that was really apparent during the war on drugs. On the other side of it, it's, again, authoritarian nostalgia. Nostalgia of it was good economic policies during the Marcos era. It was the golden years of the Philippines. So because of the failures of the neoliberal regimes in the past, since 1986, Duterte and Marcos are able to say, that failed you. Now let's go back to the way it was when you know it was Marcos Sr. who was a president. Well, let's go straight to the economy, because if part of this is because people's lives and promises of better lives have not been realised, if you look at economic growth in the Philippines, in recent years, it's been one of the most dynamically growing countries in the region, 7.6% last year, 6.3% so far this year. So, David, let me stay with you for a minute. How much of this is directly connected to government policy? Has there been any substantial shift in economic policy under Marcos Jr.? Well, one thing about the Marcos regime is that there's economic policy continuity from the Duterte administration to the point that he hired the similar technocrats and bureaucrats to be in charge of budget and management, um, the finance department. So there's policy continuity in that sense. In terms of the middle class, for example, a lot of people like the tax laws that Duterte pushed through. So the train, we call it the train law, that really cut down taxes for the middle class and like professionals and gave higher taxes to those who are earning higher. So to that extent, a lot of people will say we benefited from the tax cuts that the Duterte regime gave us. But also there's policy continuity. It's not as drastic a change in policy from the Aquino administration to the Duterte administration, but from the Duterte administration to the Marcos administration, it's definitely the same people, the same policies that are in place. So how does that fit with the narrative of a return from one Marcos to another Marcos to a better time? I think it's a matter of framing it. Like the way that the Marcos presidency frames it is that it's going to benefit people the way we manage our taxes. And also his promises on the economy was to provide more jobs in the industrial sector, in the agriculture sector, in the tourism sector. He hasn't even chosen an agriculture secretary. So Marcos Jr. is in charge of the agriculture sector as a department right now. So yeah, it's a matter of framing it like we're doing more jobs. I would say it's still quite hard to say whether there's change in that in those areas because he's only been in power less than a year. So I guess we'll see more in the coming years whether that's actually changed, whether he's actually created more jobs for Filipinos. And Adele, if we sort of look at a, a healthy economy, if you like, how much is it key to a healthy democracy that you need strong economic participation to have a healthy democracy? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, political sociology would say it's really important and actually kind of imperative. And I think the connection between kind of the economic elements and the political or democratic elements are really important here. The big picture of kind of Philippine economic growth has always been that 
despite GDP being impressive, it was impressive under Aquino, and it continues to be very respectable. The inflation is incredibly high at the moment. People are really struggling to just buy the rice that they need and the other things that they need to feed their family. And the Gini coefficient remains incredibly high. So inequality is incredibly high. So the capacity of the institutions of the economy and the political institutions to distribute any economic gains that the country might make is very weak and has remained weak. And so what we're not seeing is, you know, the addressing of these fundamental institutional problems of distribution. And those things, you know, probably, to be honest, would only have been tackled in a hypothetical scenario which didn't emerge. Lenny Robredo, the competitor of Bongo Marcos, had won the presidency because she was serious about that sort of policy reform. But, you know, Marcos, Giderte, Aquino, these are dynastic families. They belong to the elite and they are going to give away very little in terms of institutional reform that would distribute wealth. Because at the moment, not to be too cliche about it, but that's kind of how the system is oiled, that you can take large amounts out of it. I mean, even, for example, there was a a new natural gas project approved in the part of the South China Sea very recently that China doesn't control. I mean, that the corporation that's in charge of that is owned by, you know, an elite figure who's friends with the politicians and so on. So I guess it really does come down to the capacity of any growth to be delivered to people on the ground. And if that doesn't get addressed, then looking at GDP growth as a figure is... It's hollow. Yes, exactly. And Adele, I guess on that issue of the elites, and you know, this of course is nothing new and it's not unique to the Philippines either, but if certain sections of society benefit from power, have those elites changed at all under Marcos or is it the same beneficiaries who have benefited from Duterte and from regimes before? Oh, that's an interesting question. And David might be able to speak more to the specifics of that. But certainly, I mean, what you often see is not sort of a a change, but a reshuffle. So even just in recent days or weeks, there's been reshuffling of people from one political party to the other. This is what we, we mean when we say political parties don't have the same kind of function as we might expect them to have in other places. And that would be about posturing to try and kind of do a little play on power. But at the end of the day, the money stays in that elite circle, but the kind of configurations change, people jump from political party to the other. And I don't know, David, if you have greater insights into this recent jump of Sarah Duterte with Bong Bong's sister and the former president. It's very interesting. Well, if you look at it, the Philippine Congress, which is the House of Representatives and the Senate, are the most evident Uh, representations of the elites from the provinces and from the capital. And um, you're exactly right. Like there has been a reshuffle. It's not really some elites are, you know, completely thrown out of the picture. It's just which elites are more powerful this time. What's happening now is interesting because Gloria Arroyo was a former president before Aquino And she was key to this alliance between Sara Duterte and Bongbong Marcos in the 2022 elections. People call her the godmother of that alliance. Um, But now we're seeing um, fractures within that alliance between Sara Duterte and the president. We also know from sources that the president and his sister currently are not on the same page in terms of some economic policies. I think what's happened with Gloria Arroyo is a power play within the House of Representatives in terms of who controls the speakership because the House Speaker in the Philippines has control over all the pork barrel funds, all the largesse from the executive. So it's a power play, definitely. Um, So it would be interesting how the politics of this evolves. I think definitely Sarah is positioning herself to run for president in 2028. So we'll see how that goes. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au.
I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Philippines observers David Lazada and Dr Adele Webb. We're talking about the health of democracy in the Philippines one year into the presidency of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Let's have a look at um, some of those very specific policy areas. And we started, David, you were making the point that in terms of how much has changed, you said many of those extrajudicial killings are continuing, but Marcos is not as bad as Duterte. Uh, In fact, he promised a different approach to the war on drugs, didn't he? I mean, what is happening and is there any indication of a different approach? So my insights from this comes from field work that I just finished last year in the Philippines, talking with victims and survivors of the war on drugs and extrajudicial killings. If you ask grassroots activists, they will say that the war on drugs is still continuing, but there has been a shift. So there's been two shifts in the killings in the war on drugs. The first three years of the Duterte regime Most of those who were killed in the war on drugs, those who were victims in the EJ case, are uh, drug users. So small-time drug users in the slum areas, in the urban poor areas. And then in 2019, when Duterte's peace deal with the left fell through, you then have a shift of killings to more activists. Um, So this is where we call red tagging uh, came in the picture where if the government says you're a communist, you'll be in a list and you can get imprisoned or killed by elements of the police or the military. And then now with the Marcos regime, what they're seeing is it's more vigilante killings. So from the Duterte era, it was the police and then some involvement from the military because of the red tagging issue. Now it's mostly vigilante killings. And we're still seeing a lot of activists getting killed. So that's why people say it's a continuity. But vigilante killings uh, that are authorized by who? That's very hard to say. But I would say uh, recently there's some killings of political elites in the in the provinces so we're not sure if it's like a strategic policy of killing or it's just random um just because of the the culture of impunity that was created in the Duterte era that people are now more confident that they can just you know carry out extrajudicial killings with impunity So with that, because you also said earlier that there is a certain amount of space being given to human rights organisations because it's not as bad as it was under Duterte. David, in a very practical sense, what does that actually mean? What does it allow them to do? It's mostly for them to re-strategize. What were the lessons learned? What did we go through during the Duterte era? Because of all the things that were happening before, they didn't have space to think and reflect on their experiences. So now they're able to craft strategies of how to engage with government, what policy should be in place to protect ourselves uh, in terms of legal services, what types of legal services can we provide victims of human rights abuses. For the Commission on Human Rights, for example, they're now able to create a monitoring system on how to report these kinds of extrajudicial killings, which they didn't have before at the start of the Duterte administration. For those more concerned with the lobbying and the legislative side of human rights, this administration has given them some space to re-strategize also on what their lobbying strategies are, to reconnect with their allies in Congress um, and do political mapping of what issues Can we possibly propose that would benefit children, for example, or people deprived of liberty? So does the Marcos government engage? Do they allow the human rights organisations to do their own sort of lobbying? And will they engage themselves as a government? The lobbying actually was never threatened in a way. During the Duterte era, you also had lobbying, especially against capital punishment, especially on the children's rights space. So yes, the lobbying still continues. So civil society organizations within that space are able to engage with the legislators in the House of Representatives. I wouldn't say they would be directly lobbying with the executive department, with the Marcos regime, but it's mostly via the legislators. 
Adele, on the on the one hand, we're looking at how lobbying is continuing and breathing space being given to human rights organisations. But how does the Marcos administration respond to criticism? And how does it respond to this sort of human rights activism? And, and how different is that response to what it was under Duterte? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Ali. I mean, David has spoken so insightfully about the kind of machinations on the ground. But if you take a step back, there's no doubt that Bongbong Marcos is kind of a less blustering figure. You know, Duterte went out of his way to make a point about telling the US, for example, to stop lecturing the Philippines about human rights abusers. Who are you to lecture us about human rights abusers? Referring to the history of the Americans in the Philippine Islands. But I think there's a kind of like a different diplomacy or diplomatic tone to this government. But at the same time, when it comes to kind of questions about materially how different is that, I think David has kind of spoken so well to that. So in a sense, you know, Marcos is trying to make sure that he stays warm and friendly with the Biden administration and so on. So he can't really go around doing what Duterte was doing and telling the UN and Obama to, you know, basically cursing at them and telling them to get out of Philippine business. Well, I'll come back to the domestic side of this in a minute, but the international relations picture, which is one that we haven't touched on yet, and in some ways, I guess, David, would you say is that actually perhaps a point of difference between Marcos and Duterte? Because Duterte took the Philippines closer to China, as certainly at the outset of his rule, and then towards the end, he did pivot back to the US. But Marcos is very, I mean, he's close to the US, he's very well schooled in American politics, isn't he? Yeah, you're exactly right. I think that's actually a key point of his administration and a point that he's getting praised for among academic circles. Duterte pivoted the Philippines from the US to China. Now Marcos is more adopting a more strategically ambiguous type of foreign policy. He's expanded the US and Philippines agreement on basis in having an American presence in the Philippines while also signing economic deals with China. So he's getting a lot of praise for that from local experts for what he's doing. I think it's the right strategy to to adapt, especially with what's happening in the South China Sea. Do you agree, Adele, with that, that analysis? Yeah, I do. I'm not an international relations expert, but I think if we were to be ones, we would call this um, hedging. It's a hedging policy. So, and it's the same policy as several other ASEAN nations are taking. And in a way, it's sort of saying, don't make us the pawn in your superpower play that's happening in our region. But the complication, I guess, with the Philippines in that kind of ASEAN picture or amongst other ASEAN nations is that the Philippines has the most deep and long-standing historical relationship with the US and at the same time shares the most contested territory with China. Adele, just give people a sense of that if they're not completely au fait with the history here, because that deep relationship is indeed extremely deep. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's definitely the forgotten story in American history. So Americans would probably most of them not know that they were actually the colonial administrators of the Philippine Islands for more than 45 years, the first half of the 20th century. There's a good reason why it's sort of forgotten in a sense. But yeah, so the Philippines has a long, a deep colonial history. It was colonised by the Spanish for almost three and a half centuries. And then 1898, just at the end of a revolution that the Philippine Islands had fought against Spain and basically had won, there was just uh, bar one fleet of Spanish ships in Manila Bay. The Americans at that time were having a war with Spain, the Spanish-American War, and uh, Spain lost, and they sold the Philippine Islands to the Americans for a a sum of money. Of course, it wasn't really theirs to sell, but they, they assumed it was. Then the Americans were the owners of this archipelago and had two choices, I guess, to kind of allow it to continue on its path of kind of revolutionary independence. And uh, there was a strong sense of nationalism and so on that existed in the islands. But the Americans chose the other route, which was to kind of use the Philippines as a kind of a a landing page, if you like, for their new century of democratic imperialism. So basically saying we're going to expand, we're going to have an expansive foreign policy really for the first time, at least this far into the Western Pacific, but we're not going to be like those European colonisers because they were really bad. 
we are different. We are colonizing the Philippine Islands in the name of teaching them democracy. So that's how it sat from the beginning of the 20th century until the end of the Second World War. There was a kind of policy of colonial democratic tutelage. Ironically, though, without building the institutions that would have provided the the ongoing stability. Yeah, incredibly paradoxically, like this kind of paradox of colonial democracy. So they did build some institutions, but of course, if you build institutions but do it as a colonial authority and deny people, you know, autonomy and sovereignty, basically those institutions are compromised from their very foundations. And that is the story of Philippine political institutions. They have done their best to kind of survive and reinvent themselves. But at the end of the day, these issues that we're talking about today are not contemporary issues. They're not kind of like because Filipinos just can't do politics or are not good at democracy. You know, one has to tell this colonial story of American legacy in the islands and the legacy of kind of political institutions in order to understand what's happening today. David, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think the key term the Americans used was benevolent assimilation, where they will be the kinder types of colonial power. But if you look at the economic policy post-independence, America had a lot of power and control over how the Philippines can conduct its trade. They had preferential treatment of trade. And also, if you look at the problems with our political system, especially the local politics, it was the Americans who empowered these local political elites to have the power that they now have. So that's exactly right. It's, you have to look at the history here of the Philippines as, as a political system and as a society. David, if we can just bring our conversation back into the here and now and the the one year after the election of of Marcos Jr. We've talked a little about human rights and and the extrajudicial killings, but what about some of the other areas? And I'm thinking, for example, the judiciary, because under Duterte, we saw the former Secretary of Justice, Leila de Lima. She was a very vocal critic and she was imprisoned on false charges. She has now been released. Do you read into that, that we are seeing greater independence of the judiciary under Marcos? Um, I would say yes to an extent. I talked to some of the people who were behind the lobbying for that release, and they are saying, yes, the Marcos presidency is more receptive to these kinds of issues, for example. So we, we might see some more judicial more judicial independence during this time. Also relevant here is the cases against Rappler and Maria Ressa. Well, indeed, your old workplace. But there are still outstanding charges against Maria Ressa, aren't there? Yeah, there still are. Um, it's more the libel complaint. I think that's in the Supreme Court level already. And also the order to close Rappler in itself. But yeah, I think you would see more judicial independence from the Marcos presidency, but also because like the Duterte administration packed the Supreme Court with so many justices. I forget the specific number, but I think the majority of justices now were appointed by the Duterte presidency. Um, so as long as there's no difference between the policies between the two administrations, I wouldn't see any reason why the judicial system would be negative towards Marcos or would have an oppository tone against the Marcos presidency. So does that mean that those who are victims of human rights violations don't have any better recourse than they did under Duterte? I would say so. So what they're doing now is most of the victims are joining the case in the International Criminal Court. They're filing statements of what's happened to their families. So the number one recourse that most victims would see now is the international level. Those who choose to engage in the local courts, they file mostly administrative cases against the perpetrators, against the police, because administrative cases take faster to get resolved. I think none of the criminal charges that the victims I engaged with filed against policemen responsible for the war on drugs have gotten positive results, whereas those who engage in administrative cases got their results immediately. But because it's an administrative case, it's not a criminal case, so the police would just get reshuffled or they would lose their benefits or they would get fired. They wouldn't really go to jail for what they did. So there's no great accounting under the new president for what went before? Not yet. 
It's interesting, kind of symbolic, that when I was there in 2015, you know, I was um, talking with some older people who were still waiting to get compensated for their human rights abuses under Marcos Senior, because 70,000 people were imprisoned and 34,000 estimated were tortured during those years of Marcos Senior, and they were still waiting. That was kind of, you know, 1972 to 1981. And in 2015, I met people waiting for that compensation or the acknowledgement that it had happened and so on. So, I mean, this is sort of the time frame that we're dealing with here. So it gives you some picture of the expectations that people might have of accountability. As you say, historically, the time frame, what we're seeing now it would not surprise anyone. But are you hopeful, either of you, that there is momentum, that there will be change? Look, in terms of accountability for these sort of things, I have to say no. I think the past is the best predictor of this and I don't see any reason why there will be a change from the inertia of, of the past. But, you know, I still go back to that idea of continuity and change because some things are changing that, and they're not necessarily the things that we might see on the surface or be able to kind of detect tangibly, but it might be at the level of attitudes changing as opposed to institutional changes. Those things are very slow. Yeah. I think from the point of view of victims of the war on drugs, they're more hopeful now for the international case because they know how slow the the domestic judicial system is. Some of the victims' organizations don't even actively file cases anymore. They're more focused on rehabilitation, trying to move on with their lives, improving their livelihoods, just because they know how difficult and how long it will take for the judicial system to work. So yeah, what Adele was saying, not really a lot of institutional change, but more of the attitudes. Against that backdrop and against going back to the beginning of our podcast and Adele's comments about the weak party system and not really divides along ideological lines, how do ordinary Filipinos, that the people in the street, how do they feel about the health of their democracy? And how much do we actually know about that? Because, of course, it's a massively generalised question. Adele, if I can go to you first. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. There's lots of layers to unpack in it. I mean, and also, you know, talking to people on the street might belong to very different kind of sections of society and have a very different kind of perspective from that. I mean, keeping in mind more than half of Filipinos, I think David would be right to say, would be statistically living below the poverty line. Yeah. But the Filipinos, in my perspective, have a very interesting relationship with democracy. So I think... The complication there is that when we ask that question, we have an idea of what we mean about democracy in our minds. And then we think that if they say, yes, I really like democracy and it's going really well for us, we think that they are judging it according to the criteria that we ourselves might have. And that's how we've got to a situation where outside observers, even lots of the academic literature, would call um, the Filipinos kind of impressions on democracy that all is well, you know, it's going really well, naive, gullible, confused, unsophisticated, you name it, These this language kind of gets used. But in fact, what we need to do is take a step back and think, when we ask that question, what democracy are people imagining? What do they think and expect of democracy that is meeting their criteria and enabling them to say, yes, it's going well? So when we kind of reframe it like that, we can see that the kind of expectations of transformation through democracy are very kind of tempered in the Philippines because why would you have expectations that democracy is going to transform your nation and your life when it really never has? So I guess that's one layer of it. But in my own work, what I've found is that people are more ambivalent about democracy than they are kind of unconditionally committed to it. And that is to say that they basically, and I did my research mostly amongst middle class Filipinos, that there's this kind of very stable, very long term and deep seated ambivalence, which is like a say, literally a saying of yes and no to democracy. So yes, I like democracy. Yes, democracy is great. Yes, we want to be a democracy. Democracy means freedom. At the same time, remaining open to and even tolerant of top-down government and authoritarian forms of governance and being kind of permissive of that. And that in itself is a kind of like a a reflection of the, the more complex attitudes that people in places like the Philippines with the colonial history that they've had 
you know, this is the empirical reality that people are not either for or against democracy. They have a much more complex and nuanced and historically embedded relationship with democracy. Indeed, Adele, you've written an entire book called The Philippines' Long Journey to Democratic Ambivalence. Uh, David, do you agree with that? And is there that it's almost like a foot in both camps? I'll have a bit of democracy, I'll have a bit of autocracy. Oh, very much so. I think Adele made a lot of very good points. Um, but also, one aspect of this is also class. So we, if you engage with the middle class or those who are educated, they would be able to answer that question and say, okay, democracy is unhealthy, democracy is uh, whatever, however they experience it. From my experience in my circles, a lot of the middle class or some of those who are educated middle class young professionals, because of the Marcos presidency, because Marcos won, are now all trying to leave the country. There was that surge of like emotions of trying to leave the country. But if you look at, if you engage with more of the urban poor or rural poor populations, I don't think they would even have that as a concern, like democracy as a concern, because they would be so concerned about their everyday living. It's a question that can only be answered by a specific class, I would say. So I wonder then whether you can answer this question, David. Would you, and this I suppose goes back uh, historically to, for example, the hopes and the dreams of the, for the Philippines after uh, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. left the country, but would you describe the Philippines as a beacon for democracy? Hmm, good question. I would say yes. I would still say yes. Because if you look at it, some of the some of the institutions democratic institutions are still in place people and civil society activists still have some mechanisms that they can go through to pursue justice for example and marcos and sara duterte won by elections so it may not be the results that we wanted but it's the result that people chose, like the majority of Filipinos chose. So I would say still, yeah, it's still a beacon for democracy in that sense. Adele? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I agree with David. And it almost um, even this idea of ambivalence, I don't mean it negatively. I actually think it can be understood positively because there's a kind of a narrative or a story in which the Philippines completely abandoned democracy and chose you know, not to throw out Marcos Senior, for example, in that moment, and to do what most of the other nations in their region have done, and they haven't. So in other words, you know, maybe being ambivalent, having an ambivalent position towards democracy is how you stay in the game, and you don't kind of throw it out altogether. Neither do you be so naive as to say, yes, whatever you want to do, that's fine, I'll accept it, because Filipinos are very engaged in politics a lot of them. So I think, yeah, there is a sense in which we could say that democracy is very much alive and well. Um, it might not meet our standards from the outside of what we would like to see, but I think we have to just change the way we ask that question and we think about what we're seeing. But certainly I think it's bucking the trend in the region and in that sense, yes, it's still a beacon in the region. Look, it's an absolutely fascinating look at the Philippines. And I guess with five more years left of the younger Marcos as president, there's plenty of opportunity for us to have this conversation again and to watch the progress of Marcos Jr. as president. An enormous thank you to both of you for your insights. Thank you very much, David. And thank you, Adele. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Our guests have been Dr. Adele Webb from the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra and David Lazada, current PhD candidate at Asia Institute. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find us and helps spread the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 23rd of May 2023. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company. <laughs>